Hello there from uh, ICA, UFI, and PCMA Asia Pacific. Uh, this is Asia Pacific Conversation for the Planet IMX. Uh, please welcome uh, joining me today, uh, Karen Bollinger, the Managing Director of Asia Pacific of PCMA, Mark Cochrane, the Regional Director of Asia Pacific of UFI, and I'm Noor, the Regional Director of Asia Pacific of ICA. Uh, welcome, Karen. Welcome, Mark. How are you? Thank you. Doing well, thanks, Noor. Well, uh, that was uh, just the formality of the start. Uh, well, that's okay. Um, uh, how's things down in Melbourne and Hong Kong? Uh, Karen and Mark, maybe Karen? Well, well, we're in about week 10 or 12 of lockdown now, the second, second third lot of lockdown, actually. Um, so we're all a little bit over it, a little bit frustrated, but we're coming into spring, so... Um, it's a gorgeous day outside today, and I think if we can push through the next four weeks, we'll be um, rocking and rolling. And I think, you know, people are really anxious to get back to business. That's, I think, probably the biggest um, issue that we all have at this point in time. So you were, you were, on, um, um, you were cleared, and then you were on lockdown again. Is that, is that so? Yeah, so we had... Um, we had lockdown in uh, back in March, June. We opened back up, and then uh, it got the infections got away with us. We went to a stage three lockdown for four weeks, and then we went to stage four for six weeks. And now we're in the second lot of six weeks. So yes, yes it'll be October before we really fully open up. To me, sometimes you know when you talk about you know the stage three lockdown, uh, you know all those uh, terminology that we have. I think. Um, uh, you know, this is a global pandemic, yet uh, there's no one uh, single language that all of us are, are using, you know. And in Malaysia, we call it a green, yellow zone, red zone, you know. Uh, you have, uh, you know, lock, level three, level five, level one, you know. I think, is it the world not really coming back together as one, you know, because this is the global issue. You know, that's a great question, Noor, because I, I think you're right. We don't even have common language. It's a bit like the business events world, really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. Nice business events. Yeah. Um, so, so, um, so we're just following suit, really. But you, you're right, because I guess, you, you know what, and I said that thinking you knew what I meant at stage three. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there was an interesting assumption there, which in fact, you know, if I'd have said yellow or, or green, you may have known differently. We still so, wouldn't yeah. have known. Yeah. But, <laughs> what but are you doing in Hong Kong? So in Hong Kong, yeah, we're coming to the end of uh, what they're calling the second wave. We had restrictions in place for March and April. We had a pretty normal May and June. Uh, a few B2C exhibitions even went ahead in May. Uh, and then we got a second wave. Uh, it, it's all relative, right? I mean, compared to uh, different countries around the world. But uh, I think we peaked at uh, between 100 and 150 a day in July. But that was sufficient for the government to shut down most things. So. Uh, restaurants were only takeaway, schools were closed, uh, gyms, swimming pools, that sort of thing. They are starting to ease the restrictions now. So the number of cases is pretty minimal. I think over the last two weeks, we've averaged about 10 a day. And uh, restaurants are allowed to open till 9 p.m. Maximum number of people is uh, four people at a table. But still, still no gatherings or no events allowed. Uh, and yeah, just as Karen said, I think people are pretty anxious to get back to business now, for sure. Great. I think, uh, I hope that uh, things in Melbourne gets better soon. So, you know, you'll be able to get out of home and do more things, uh, business activities and so forth. Uh, but from Kuala Lumpur, where I'm based, uh, uh, things are a bit more positive compared to both of you. Uh, we've been uh, reopened for about uh, almost two and a half months now. And wow. uh, uh, the good thing is that uh, yeah. with the good health system, and I think uh, one of the things that we've been talking about this in all the webinars is that clear communication. So um, apparently the government, especially through the Ministry of Health, managed to do that uh, very, very well on a daily yeah. basis, telling us uh, where are the hotspots, uh, where are the new cluster uh, happening? So, you know, even though we still have uh, infection happen uh, every day, but uh, it is uh, more well controlled in the sense that we know where it's happening. So the rest of the nation are not closed. Um, currently, um, 
uh, for the last uh, one month, more, more than one month now, that the business, act, business event activity has been reopened. Uh, it started with uh, the government putting a cap of not more than 250 uh, people at one gathering. Uh, but then the government uh, quickly had a series of discussion with the business event members uh, through the National Association and also the Business Event Council of Malaysia, very much like uh, in Australia where you have the BECA. Um, so <coughs> the message that went out actually came out from the government, not from the industry. That is, uh, if they can allow a uh, larger gathering in a uh, house of worship, for example, depending on the size of the facility, then if the business event community use that as the same parameter or guideline or as the SOP, uh, then the government will allow. So therefore today, uh, we don't have any limit anymore, uh, but it means that venue operators, hotels, uh, conference centers have to understand what are their maximum capacity. They have to undertake mm -hmm. the contact, uh, contact tracing, and especially business event, the delegates all are pre-registered. So uh, we felt uh, pretty safe uh, going to event, and I have been to almost, uh, not almost, I've already been to three live events in Kuala Lumpur. Um, yeah, I saw, or I saw on the news this week that uh, a B2B exhibition went ahead in KL, right? And the, the Prime Minister opened it and there were something like 4,000 plus visitors the first day, right? Yes, uh, they had uh, a few B2B and also some uh, B2C uh, exhibition going on in Kuala Lumpur already. This is part, I think, of the um, local government uh, initiative uh, to provide uh, subvention uh, to the local event. I think this is the, the thing that's happening in Kuala Lumpur. And I think this, uh, this is what, what I, I always call as the copy economy. You know, that you know, uh, someone get it right and someone just need to copy and do it better. So I hope that you know, right. everybody come to some sense in the region, you know? Yeah, and, and you know what's good though, um, Noor, is, is uh, and I think that what the, the next thing is that there's um, how do we stimulate demand? Mm -hmm. um, and then from a regional perspective, I think we actually have a responsibility. So it's great that we're all talking today about how do we make sure we actually lift ourselves up first as a collective rather than what we've been dependent on in the past. So I think we've got to start probably thinking and looking differently as far as that's concerned. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think there's lots of opportunity in learning from each other, but I think we actually have to then be smarter about how we apply it. True. I think uh, in, in, in the sense that we are now uh, speaking for our audience at the uh, Planet IMAX, um, we are the three faces of three international organization based in Asia Pacific, like it or not. You know, this morning, just before we had this conversation, I was looking at the map of Asia Pacific again and again. And then I come to realize one uh, important fact compared to maybe Europe or North America. Asia Pacific is a large area, uh, economically strong, uh, culturally very diverse, but yet we are actually very divided. Uh, you know, almost every destination or country in Asia Pacific are uh, a standalone. Uh, Hong Kong, for example, you are an island. Australia, <laughs> you <are> island. <laughs> you have, uh, big island. Uh, Singapore, <laughs> Borneo, uh, Japan, you know, whatnot. Uh, and and, and even, even for the fact that uh, we have China connected uh, in the mainland of Asia with Thailand, Indochina, and Malaysia, but in, in the real sense, not really connected well connected as compared to Europe. So, you know, so I think this, this pandemic really bring us a huge challenge because like in Europe, when they are reopening, they can say that Europe is open for business. So you can travel yeah. from one country to another. But Asia Pacific, when we say we are open for business, you can't really drive from Melbourne to Hong Kong or to Kuala Lumpur <laughs> for that matter. I think this is, yeah. uh, you know. Yeah, and also I think, I, I mean, from the perspective of exhibitions, the closed borders is a real problem. Uh, unless you're in a market like China or Japan, where the B2B uh, exhibitions, the domestic economy is big enough to support them. Mm -hmm. You look at a market like Hong Kong or Singapore, and unless travel is easy and convenient, the exhibitions here can't go ahead. E even if we're COVID free, if there's no agreement of you know, quarantine, 
quarantine free travel between say Hong Kong and Thailand or Hong Kong and Korea, uh, it, it's really gonna be hard to make a go of any B2B exhibitions in those markets. And actually, to a lesser degree, I mean, it's great that events are happening again in KL and they are in Bangkok as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, The the economies there are big enough to support B2B events, but they're going to be really a lot. They're going to be significantly impacted without those international uh, visitors and exhibitors at those events. I think, Mark, uh, when we're talking about the concept of that uh, map that I was talking about, Asia Pacific map, um, in your thoughts now, uh, which destinations are really being reopened from the exhibition point of view? You mentioned Japan, uh, Hong Kong, is that? Uh, Korea? Yeah, yeah I, can, I can run you through quickly because it, it, there, there's uh, a wide range of what's going on. Uh, the biggest market is China, which accounts for about 60% of net space sold every year for mm-hmm. exhibitions. Uh, and they are really back to business now. Things are operating as normal but without international participation. But of mm-hmm. course, just given the size of the Chinese economy, the, the events can be still, you know, 60, 70, even 80% of what they were pre-COVID. Mm-hmm. So uh, China's easily the market doing best. And then there are a few others that are open, but uh, are really severely impacted by the lack of travel. So mm-hmm. uh, Malaysia has some events going on, Thailand, uh, Korea and Japan a little bit, but they, they've had somewhat of a second wave as well. Uh, the, the, other, the other factor is you need to have the confidence of the participants. It's okay if the government says you can go ahead with an event, but uh, I know some organizers have found in Korea, even when they pressed ahead with events, actually their uh, exhibitors and visitors said, you know what, no thanks, we'll, we'll wait till 2021. So it, it's a little bit of a balance. Two, I two think those the- are the key. Uh, sorry, I was just going to wrap up. I was just going to, I think those are the key markets that have some uh, B2B exhibition activity ha- or even B2C. Uh, but places like Hong Kong and Singapore, essentially zero. Uh, Singapore is planning to do some pilot projects, I think, next month. But they're going to be heavily restricted and borders are still closed there, essentially. Yeah. I just want to add, I think, uh, two more destinations that maybe you, you missed just now is that the two most greenest destination. Or you call it level zero now. Uh, that is uh, New Zealand and Taiwan or Chinese Taipei. So I think uh, they have done very well with the COVID nineteen. Right, right. So yeah, N- New Zealand going ahead, uh, Taiwan. But as you can imagine, it, it's a heavily export oriented economy. So you know, all, all of their biggest events they need uh, that international participation. So yes, they've done very well for COVID and deserve recognition for that in Taiwan, but the limited um, meaningful B2B exhibition activity there. So, so Karen, uh, from, from the meeting space, um, corporate, um, the one that PCMA is tracking, uh, how, how do you perceive the region is moving now? Uh, where are the pockets of areas that's really coming out? Well, I, I think it's it's not too dissimilar to, to Mark, I guess. And I, and I think, you know, New Zealand's opened up. They had some small cases in Auckland. They had to close back down again. Mm. Um, you know, Australia's a mixed bag. Some of our borders are even closed within our own country and some are open and then some have only got parts of them open. So it's a real mishmash. And I think that, um, you know, any country, but particular destinations like, you know, Australia, which has a very large footprint from, you know, a, um, I, I guess, country perspective, but population-wise, a very small po- population. So, so, you know, the entire population of Australia is Shanghai's population. <laughs> so, yeah, um, so we don't have the mass, I mean, the two biggest cities, Sydney and Melbourne, 5.5 million in each. So you can't draw on necessarily people to attend events like you would have generally and even participate in them. Uh, But also, you know, the economy actually has some impact in that as well. And I think, you know, we do need to recognise and acknowledge that we can all open up as we like, but if companies aren't travelling or aren't giving their their, um, blessings because of the risk and health 
factors that people are facing, it actually becomes a bigger challenge for us as an industry. So, so the borders may come down, we may have lovely hygienic venues, but unless we actually have people coming in and utilising those venues, mm -hmm. then we actually mm -hmm. still don't have a business as, as such. So, so I actually think it's going to be a while off before that comes. Um, and I think part of the, the travel restrictions that we have, so we talk about Australia, in, you know, they talk about June next year before we'll actually right. be able right. to do some true international travel. Um, you can travel domestically, but it's, again, limited borders. But I think the same thing is you know, Singapore have the same paying points. Mm. They are predominantly mm. a leisure destination. They don't have a lot of other industries to rely on. So they've been hit in a very big way. Um, and again, you know, their, their um, economy is very different from locals don't necessarily go and stay in hotels for weekends right. like right. they do in others. So, so again, you know, you've just got layers upon layers of, of, of activity going on or challenges, as, as you say. So, so even though destinations are opening up, we know Thailand's open up for business pretty much fully. Um, Korea, as you said, Mark is, Japan is. I think what we have to get back to is whether our customers, whether they're associations or corporates, are going to let their employees attend events and can they afford to be sending the numbers that they actually Safety. Yeah, I, th I think that's a, a really good point is uh, we often find ourselves so focused on the government restrictions holding us back. And uh, even when once those are removed, you remind me about company restrictions, some very big companies in the US like uh, Oracle, Facebook, uh, I'm not sure if it was Amazon, but a number of big tech companies, they essentially said they're not going to allow their employees to travel right. to events mm -hmm. of more than 50 people until one of them, it was like mid 2021 and another, it was the end of 2021. Mm. So company restrictions, not allowing their employees to travel. That's one. And budgets is a huge one. Even once we reopen and assuming that it was safe to travel, a lot of budgets are going to be really constrained. So what are the choices that uh, potential exhibitors and visitors at events are going to make? Are they going to cut participation this year and next year, or are they going to pour more into a face-to-face -face event? It, it's really an unknown. Yeah, I, th I think uh, uh, Karen and Mark, I think you touched on the, the really uh, important point about you know being able to reopen because we are experiencing that in Malaysia at the moment. I'm sure in other other countries in Asia Pacific that has gone through this phase, I think the the next phase of challenges that uh, we are all facing is the confidence level. Uh, the demand level and also uh, uh, the perception of that uh, the new norm, uh, the new events that you're going to organize because you would acquire more space for lesser people. Uh, those were the days that you can cram up right. people in a small room, but now you can't do that anymore. So events are being perceived to be more expensive, uh, especially that uh, not everybody able to come in. And I think the, the, the challenge that, uh, that I'm, 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 I'm facing every day in Kuala Lumpur is uh, the involvement of a tech company. Uh, the perception is that it's going to be more expensive because this is something that we never do. You know, you have 5,000 delegate or 500 delegate, you rely on a PowerPoint or, and a projector. So that is your high tech, right? And the most high tech maybe is a speaker for your, for your PowerPoint show. But now you really have to invest. And uh, people are talking about, you know, hologram, uh, virtual experience, uh, and all those um, things that, uh, they're, that, that they're, they're going through. So back to the uh, conversation that we're having today, again, uh, Karen and Mark, uh, one of the questions that our audience at Planet, uh, Planet IMAX uh, want to know from us is that, what are our biggest challenge at the moment as association in this space? Uh, <laughs> go ahead. Oh, I was going to, I actually think it is about stimulation of, of demand because I, I just think that, um, you know, it doesn't matter how safe and hygienic your venue is, unless, unless people feel um, financially comfortable, psychologically safe, and um, their risk mitigation is in place, it will be very difficult to get people back. And, and I think what we have to do is come to terms with the fact that we need to utilise technology to our advantage, because I think 
We all know this will never replace face-to-face. -face. But you know the question I ask, and yeah. I'll be very, very, very contentious here, hmm. is that us speaking to ourselves, as in the industry? Because we love it, because we get to travel, we're in it because we're all about the people. But our customers, so corporates, uh, you know, associations, do they miss it and feel that they miss it as well? And I'm, I'm, I'm not saying yes or no to that, yeah. but I'm saying I think we actually have to start doing some assessment about what our customers want, not necessarily what we want. True. And, and so once we get clarity on that, then we can actually start to rebuild because we're not going back. I, I think, you know, we just can't be, we'd be really um, remiss to think that we are going back to what it was. I think what it will be in the future is very different. And I'm not saying it's going away, by the way. What I'm saying is the face-to-face -face component will be incredibly different. And I think we actually have to prepare for that. And we have to actually start to acknowledge about how do we bring in technology? How do we bring in, you know, the use of our spaces very differently? And how do we actually engage our audience to grow them um, and retain them so that they actually then become, you know, lifelong advocates, customers, whatever that would actually be. So I think it's a challenge. And I actually think it's a challenge for some of the industry to actually, <laughs> did I say that? Um, to actually um, to think about. And I think the more you talk to a customer, the more you'll understand that we've actually, it shouldn't be solving for us, we should be solving for them. I, I totally agree with you, Karen. You know, we are, a lot of times we are, talking to ourselves, you know, we, we, are, we are so hype out doing things that we think that uh, this is what our clients or the industry need from us, but actually that is actually something that we've been pushing down to them. I think uh, there's a great perspective. I couldn't agree more with you. I think, uh, so uh, first I'll, I'll give you the two challenges that I think I'd put at the top of the list and then I'll uh, address a couple things Karen said. Uh, so th the challenges facing us, for exhibitions for UFI's members. First is travel restrictions. We can't, if we don't establish travel bubbles, the industry is not going to restart. And the second one goes to what uh, Karen addressed, which is stakeholder confidence. If the participants aren't confident in participating, that it's safe uh, and um, cost effective to participate in the events, then we're not going to have events. I, I think I'm more optimistic than both of you that it, it's not just us, our industry, that we're excited to get back to it. And the reason I say that is because uh, the proof is in the pudding in China. As soon as they eased the restrictions and they said, okay, you can go ahead for this B2B event or this B2C event, the crowds were enormous and the uh, exhibitors returned with very few exceptions. And a lot of international um, exhibitors found ways to send representatives, even though they couldn't do their through, through branch offices or through partners. So I think the appetite for face to face will still be there on the other side of COVID. Some of the ways we operate may be different, but I think that, uh, that need to, to go visit a potential supplier to hold uh, a product that you're going to place an order for. I don't think that's going away. Uh, well, I, 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 I couldn't agree more with you also, Mark, because I think um, even for from the association space that uh, ICA, we, are, we have quite a big number of our members. Uh, in fact, the biggest chapter in the, in the global ICA, global membership is Asia Pacific. Uh, we have just touched uh, the 300 mark, uh, and very much like Ufi, our biggest membership in the world is China. So um, yeah. that is good, but it, at times uh, scary as well because you know you have one <laughs> everything in the one basket. Uh, I would say that the biggest challenge is you know the membership. Uh, people not able to, to travel. We we can't uh, meet face to face. But when I think more about uh, this question that um, that IMAX have put up, put on us. I think the biggest challenge in uh, the association space is more of the business model that we have. Um, when I say that, uh, it, it just opened the Pandora box, you know, in the sense that, um, you know, we, 90% of our membership deliverables are face-to-face, -face. you know, um, almost 99% of our activities are based face-to-face. -face. You know, it's almost like if you can't meet, you can't do business. 
So, you know, right, uh, right. we are over dependent on that business model. Um, and, and of course, the, the end product of the um, association meeting is basically events uh, where destinations, uh, venues, suppliers are very much dependent on uh, events coming to their, their destination. And that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen for the next six months, one year or more. We don't know. So I think the, the, the biggest challenge is really the business model. Uh, we, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just looking at uh, during the uh, lockdown that we had in Kuala Lumpur. You know, I was at home uh, with the family. Uh, we can't even get out. Um, and then uh, after a few weeks, the government said you can uh, drive as far as not more than five kilometers only to buy the necessity. And I'm sure that, you know, Karen, you're going through this phase now. You know, yes. you are afraid because, you know, you don't know what is out there. You know, you know the, the virus is somewhere there. You know, you might just go out and get it and you die. So that's the feeling that we have. And then it's just hit me that every day, the only person that be able to roam around the city is the uh, food deliveries. So, and it hit me back to the association market whereby uh, we are not part of the gig economy. You know, anything that we do in association, whether you are working for the association or you're running an event base, we rely on a full-time staff. Just like Eka today, we are relying on full-time staff. You know, what if we have this gig economy whereby you've been paid when you deliver your, your services? So that's, that's not, part of our, not part of our culture. So I think that's the biggest, biggest problem with our industry because uh, we have a one-track minded, um, you, know, you don't have to agree, Karen, if you, if you disagree. No, 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 I'll, I'll tell you why, because I, I think that our ecosystem was built around, um, you know, it, it is a very traditional model and I think it's probably um, potentially exposed for disruption. Mm. Um, and I, I don't think that's a, a good thing or a bad thing, quite frankly. I think it's just actually a fact of life. Um, so I think, and when I talk about that, I, I think about um, the fact that we have to change. You know, the, the next generation coming through are not this generation sitting here today. And they are being taught in schools and at universities in a very, very different way. So the way they will consume education will be very different. The way they work will be very different. Mm -hmm. They will not be like us and be in a career for our entire lives, two yeah. or three careers. Yeah. So, yeah. so the skills that we need to be delivering them and, and, the, um, and, and that includes things like, you know, being financially astute to be able to adapt your business model pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it includes things like... Um, <clears throat> understanding, you know, our new world of virtual kicks up with it, things like, you know, data literacy skills, kicks up digital marketing skills, you know, really design thinking where you're actually looking at solutions from a different way. We've, we've actually almost worked in a very long ecosystem that's been quite traditional and we've brought and modified it as we go, but there's never been a catalyst that has shifted it. And I think COVID potentially could be the catalyst. And I, by the way, don't think that we're probably seeing that now because I think there's still that when we get back instead of what could it look like. And there's probably an Uber or an, you know, an iTunes around the corner somewhere doing something that one day will wake up and surprise all of us. And, yeah. and we're going to have to adapt or die basically at the end of the day. I think just just like this recording that the three of us are doing for IMAX now, you know, you know, I don't think that we we we, we ever even thought that we're going to be doing this because we right, all right. thought that we're going to IMAX. You know, IMAX is is a is a homage that we we do every year uh, to, to to Frankfurt or to Las Vegas, uh, and and then that's not happening. But I think uh, uh, interesting that you mentioned um, Karen about um, uh, you know we need to adapt to the new skill. We need to teach our younger generation, a new way of doing things. But um, one thing that I, I just come across, especially in the association space, uh, unlearn is not easy. Uh, you know, uh, reskilling is easy. Learning new tricks is okay. But, you know, the thing with us is that we, we carry too much of this old knowledge, uh, old way of doing things, especially association, you know, because we are, some of us are 50 years old, 100 years old, mm -hmm. you know, we are proud of being old that, you know, uh, my worry is not about 
learning. It's about to unlearn. Uh, that's going to be yeah. a bigger challenge than anything. You like the adage, you teach an old dog new tricks, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> you can't, you can't. You know. is, that, is that us? <laughs> uh, pro probably so, because uh, Ufi is still with exhibition, Ika is still with association, and, and PCMA is PCMA, you know. Right, correct. That's the way it is. I, I think you guys might be right about the uh, transition of the model, but I think it's going to take a lot longer than people. A, a lot of people think that th th this is a pivotal moment where when on the other side, online revenues for say B2B exhibitions will suddenly be important. I, I don't see that because it, any exhibition organizer in order to generate online revenues, they're going to have to do it better than Alibaba or mm. better than Google. That is, that's a pretty tall order. So I'm, I'm not sure that transitioning to something where there's a significant, um, I'm talking about for exhibitions here, where there's a, sig a significant amount of online revenues that's going to replace or undermine or complement face to face. I, I think it's further off than we think. And we have some examples, like there's a company here in Hong Kong called Global Sources uh, that has been doing both uh, event and its own online platform for well, since the, the mid 90s and events are still um, the greatest source of their revenues versus online and online's been declining for that very reason that whatever platform they built, they're actually competing against the Alibabas of this world. Yeah. Tough, so how tough, are they uh, doing today with their live meetings then? Oh, for, yeah. <laughs> right. So, yeah. So, so, my, so my query then is, is that sustainable for them long term? And are they just living on hope that it will get back? Or are they actually planning for something different? And by the way, I am not saying that any of this is going away. I'm saying it will be very different. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is probably for me the key of, if you're sitting and waiting, then I think you're actually sitting and you may as well close your, close your business mm -hmm. and throw away your keys now. If you're actually thinking and thinking more strategically about what the future adds, um, and I'm not talking about shuffling the deck chairs, I'm talking about really strategically thinking, then I think that's the shift that will actually come from a business model perspective. Um, because we need to build a much more resilient business and, and, or industry, I should say. And we're not, we've just been shown that we're not resilient. Um, there are some that have moved, been able to move quickly, um, but there are some that just haven't. And, and by the way, it's not a criticism, but it's mm. actually, I think, just opportunity to really think about what a really good future could be and, and what do we need in that mix to have it. And we want to be resilient, right? We want to wake up and be able to make a dollar tomorrow and we want to bring people together and we want to sell things um, so if they're kind of the basic premises, then how do we do that? And because unless a vaccine is coming, we yeah. could be living like this for at least another two years. And, and I think that is the stuff that we've got to start saying. Well, we all thought, you know, the end of the year we might be getting back, but it's ab absolutely evident that that's not going to happen. Um, and, and our get back might be even slower than any of us would want because we're reliant on our governments to open borders and allow right, us our freedoms. Right, right. and, and, you know, if Melbourne goes back into lockdown, I mean, that's why they extended it the second time, because they said if we don't extend well, is we'll go down a month, weeks, and just, want, just don't work like that. We want to do it or manage it so that we can actually... That's that as an industry we should be thinking about. Sorry, I'm a little bit of the, um, I like to be protagonist because I, I think it stretches people. Um, and I, I, by the way, you know, obviously I'm a fan and I think that we will be back, but I just think we've got to be ready um, to take the step to something different. Yeah. Well, coming back uh, to our audience because we are doing this recording, uh, I just realized that a couple of seconds that we lost you there, maybe because my internet is slow or your internet is slow, but this is what the new normal is all about. You know, you do recording, you do not get a perfect one because we are- Actually, uh, Karen was clear for me all the way through. So I think it was on your side, Norm. Yes, definitely. So, mine. so you know, that's, that, that's a challenge that I'm having. You know? <laughs> okay, anyway, I think back to the region for the, especially for the audience who want to understand what's really going on with the Asia Pacific as a region. 
I think in short, uh, there are pockets of vaccination that are doing extremely well. There are some are catching up and there are still some other countries who are still uh, not out yet of the pandemic. You know, if, 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 if all of you follow the news, uh, destination like India, uh, Indonesia, even Sri Lanka for that matter, Philippines, uh, they are still trying to do their best because, you know, the huge population, uh, the economic profile of this destination, I think, uh, pose a huge threat and also a challenge for them to come out of, the, of this situation. So we just hope that all of them, uh, all of our friends in the industry in these areas, uh, stay strong and stay safe and come back. Uh, the second question that, um, that we have from uh, IMAX team is that um, what has COVID taught us about our business, our industry, and um, our regional ecosystem? Uh, anyone want to comment on that? Or is it a very difficult question in the first place? <laughs> big question. Uh, big question. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a pretty big question. Uh, it, it's taught us that we're a lot more vulnerable than we ever thought, uh, mm -hmm. I, I think. Uh, there's some good things uh, that have come out of it. I mean, I've seen the the exhibition, the UFI community come together faster than yeah. I ever would have thought possible. Uh, you know, obviously out of necessity, but all of us are in the position where we're trying to advocate for government support, uh, for governments to allow events to go ahead, to differentiate between say a mass gathering like a festival or a concert and an exhibition which is very different so the it, in some ways not resilient but uh, a tighter community than I think anyone ever thought we had and we've uh, had some achievements uh, in the UFI community of convincing governments of just those points that I was uh, underlining well uh, yeah. if I can if I can just add very quickly I think um, the challenge, uh, what COVID taught us is really that um, as an industry, we are not well prepared. Uh, we, did, we didn't even see this thing coming. You know, we, we live in a perfect and ideal world that, you know, pandemic <laughs> such as this will never happen in our lifetime. But come 2020, you know, uh, this is the reality. And I think um, uh, it become uh, an issue of what, what I call uh, trial and error. Uh, now, you know, uh, for, for event organizers, you know, everybody suddenly become uh, an online event expert organizer. Right. You know? So uh, jokingly, I was, I was telling some of our members who are the professional con conference organizers, they say, you know, now you don't, you don't call yourself PCO anymore. You call yourself DGO, uh, digital, DCO, digital congress organizer, because you're doing... <laughs> but again, the question is that, uh, are you really uh, good at it? In, in a sense, like you are going at the broadcast, broadcasting level. Um, we are not because mm. we are all, all at a huge trial and error. And I think from the association perspective, um, the biggest uh, question or biggest thing that COVID has taught us that I think is uh, we are not prepared with a reserve uh, for this kind of eventuality. Uh, you know, how, how long can an, an association sustain themselves? Uh, I'm looking at this all the different level of national association, regional association, and international association. The bigger associ your association is, then the bigger problem that you might have because you're, you're talking about cash flow uh, sure. and all those. How do you serve uh, your membership at large? So that, that's my take on on this big question that uh, come from IMAX. How about you, Karen? You, you know what I I think that. What it's taught us is actually the art of um, perfection isn't always the way to go, purely because we're in this. So, so you just said before, that's kind of okay now. Whereas <laughs> I think previously we just would not have accepted it. Like it was never, you know, you had to be perfect 100%. And I think, you know, you hear this all the time, people's dogs barking, kids coming in. Mm. Um, and that, that's, it's made us more and more accessible. And I think to your point, Mark, where you talk about the communities coming together, we're actually seeing each other in a very different environment than we would. And that's, I don't know about you. So you guys don't have this problem that us women have. We, we, you know, we live our lives made up. But I have to tell you, for most women I know now, if it's all in a day of internal meetings, you're lucky to get a piece of makeup on your face. And, <laughs> you know, I, I, I have my 6 a.m.s with North America. You can ask Sheriff this. There's half the time I turn up like 
no makeup on, I'm just got out of bed. In my other life, I would never have done that in a million years. I would have, you know, been up at 4 a.m. getting beautified for 6 a.m. So I think it's forgiveness. I think it's more acceptance. I think it's more openness to mistakes. Um, and then the collaboration. And, and you know, Mark, I, I take my hat off to you guys, Uthi, because you got out the gate really quickly by bringing your your community together. And I think that was fantastic thing to do and, and well done to you guys. And I know, Noor, your guys, you guys were in that as well. So, so I think that, yeah, it's it's there's some really good positives out of it. All I'm about is taking the good and the bad and then how do we actually apply it to a better future? Yeah, so that's make- uh, what, what both of you just said. Uh, and Nora, you started with the, the trial and error. I, I hadn't thought about it th- that way, but that is a real plus that's coming out of this because our industry, at least uh, exhibitions, typically uh, a risk, a fairly risk averse group of companies because the, it, it, they've been comfortable for a long time with uh, profitable events for a long time. So why experiment? And sort of the other end of the spectrum would be like tech startups where you, you, you're just changing from day to day, trying everything new uh, to see what works. And I think a little bit of that for our community is definitely a positive. And th- this pandemic has forced that on us. Yeah. So this pandemic really make us uh, even more human uh, than we used to be. <laughs> I'm not sure what, what that is supposed to mean, but it sounds like uh, we are not before, you know? <laughs> you know what? I, th- I think we're, uh, look, the business events industry is a little bit of an exception, right? The, the fact that we, we actually just like each other a lot. <laughs> so, so I think we're all good about let's go out and have drinks. And, you know, when we go to IMAX that we love, it's like a big like group gathering so yes customers are there but we also just love being with each other and and that's that's all the stuff that we actually miss so that will never go away but I think it's just how we meet that will change but I think so human maybe at 3am in the bar sometime but no I think I think I haven't seen your cat or your dog in the bar but it I reckon in this environment, there's a good chance you're going to hear or see more of that. So, so I think, you know, I think of, like, you all know where I work now in my office at home. Yeah. So, um, true, true. The, the same goes here, you know, I've been working at home for, for many months now, and now back to the office. You know, uh, my wife never seen me working because working is traveling. You know, you are out there, yes. right? but now you're working, right? Uh, at the living room, at the kitchen, you know, in the, in the, in the living room. Then the whole house become an office, and and it, it just hit me that uh, my last travel that I did was actually to AIM in Melbourne uh, in February, and uh, wow. I had a back to back trip to Yokohama and Jakarta, uh, and in fact I was in China uh, just uh, early January before the Chinese New Year. So when I arrived into into Melbourne, I was just a bit more than that that fourteen days uh, period, you know, because this is the beginning of the COVID. Now, just come to realize that we're already in September. So that's almost like seven months that uh, we've not been traveled. Karen, when was your, your last travel? You know what? It, uh, so I actually did do, uh, to, I actually went up to New South Wales to uh, present on the bushfires, bizarrely enough, bringing tourism back from bushfires. And I was one of the last ones back in just before they did the full sh- shutdown. So I, I was at Canberra Airport waiting for my flight and they just cancelled flight after flight. And I was like, am I going to get home? Yeah. <laughs> Do I need to hire a car? Now, it was only Canberra, still 10-hour drive away. So, um, so that was the last time I jumped on a plane um, to, like, a, a, true, a true plane. So, so um, when, when was that? Yeah, yeah. So when was that? March. March, okay. How about you, Mark? Uh, also March, uh, I got back to Hong Kong March 15th from, I went to Myanmar and then Singapore and it was pretty stressful at the end because I was in Singapore trying to get back to Hong Kong and requirements were changing, borders were closing and I didn't know if I was going to get out and back uh, and luckily I did. But yeah, that was the last trip. So what is that, like six months ago, I guess? Something yeah, like so, so, you know the, the reason I'm, the reason why I brought this particular topic up is that you know it shows how the the, the whole Asia Pacific region being just caught off guard with this pandemic. Uh, you know we are we are travel opportunities. We are in the business and industry, so travel is not possible anymore. So 
imagine if the borders are open tomorrow. Would you travel? Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm having I, a second thought. You know? That's why I'm <laughs> in the street. <laughs> Uh, I, uh, as soon as Hong Kong opens with anywhere, I'll go there. Wow. Wow. That, that's very positive. Would you not know? We, you wouldn't go? Uh, um, I've, I've traveled the, the furthest is uh, another state within Malaysia last month. And um, uh, I've been invited to travel within country flight to, to Sarawak, Borneo. And uh, suddenly you just have some hesitation because, uh, you know, I'm just not sure about going to airport, you know, the, you know. Yeah. It's not just about, you know, the, the, the danger in flying, but, you know, this pandemic is just uh, something that, you know, out of the mind. But anyway, I just yeah, thought... Yeah, that, 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 that is not what I'm feeling. I, I am waiting for the green light. I, when, <laughs> when they let me get on a ferry and go to Macau an hour away, I'm going to do that. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want to go beyond five kilometers. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I was like trying to find a place to take my dog to get her washed, and I was like, "Oh, it's outside my five kilometers." <laughs> I was like, "See, so, simple things, rough. right?" So back, back to a serious conversation. Um, Ufi, Ika, TCMA, uh, we are here to serve our members, right? Uh, and 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 the last uh, nine months, it has changed how we behave as an association. You know, uh, I think. Um, I'm not sure about all of you, but uh, for Ika, I would say that, you know, a huge percentage of our uh, membership delivery uh, would not mean a lot to the members anymore. Because, for example, like, you know, data, data is good, but, you know, there are no new RFP. So members will not be able to go out there and bid. Uh, and some associations, they are they already uh, forthcoming in the sense that they are opening their bid. But they are very clear that, you know, I'm going to organize a conference in uh, February next year, but it's going to be a hybrid event. So that's very clear. But there's still a lot of uh, associations who are, who are our client are still hoping that, you know, we'll be able to travel, we'll be able to have the face-to-face the, the, the -face, uh, meeting again. So um, what would you say in terms of how are we adapting to this situation in uh, benefit offering to our, mem our members? So for, uh, for UFI, we've had to adapt. And thank you for the compliment, Karen. Yeah, I, I think prior to COVID, if you ask UFI members where they get the most benefit, it's consistently been networking, me meeting other members face-to-face -face and getting value from Obviously, that's mostly gone, at least the face-to-face -face part of it. Uh, and so UFI immediately stepped up with UFI Connects, which is the, uh, the webinar series to get members together to talk about whatever issues they're facing, wide variety of topics. Uh, and then uh, the team in Paris launched the UFI coronavirus resource page, which has a lot of information about um, like uh, reopening frameworks how in markets that have reopened, what, what have they done? Getting down into the nitty gritty, uh, best, best practices for reopening, lots of re offering lots of resources for government advocacy. Because as we talked about, there, there's a number of issues uh, that we all need to communicate to our local governments. So one is that exhibitions are different from mass gatherings. Uh, and the second is the, the economic impact that uh, exhibitions on a trade shows drive trade that sort of thing um so ufi's been very active in trying to provide value um in through through those channels i so i think everybody once we can get back to face to face because generally these are event people uh then they'll be happy and excited to get back to a, an ufi congress or a regional conference karen Oh, good question. I, I guess for us, we're all about um, professional development for meeting planners at the end of the day. That's kind of our core business. And I guess we're fortunate that um, that's their biggest pain point is about how do I actually upskill? Um, and so, so we've got the tools already there and established, but I think a lot of it's then how do we bring that to life and how do we bring the communities to life? So, so there's been a lot of um, growth and activity in that area is, is making those community connections 
and making sure that the education is um, on point. And, and so it's not necessarily just rehashing the old, it's actually really thinking about how they will learn and what will actually take us into the future. So, so, um, so I've, but I think, you know, I think we're all gonna feel the pain when renewal time comes around. I think that's just going to be it. Um, and that's when I talk about resilient businesses and business models, what does that actually mean and look like? So I think that um, we've just got to be prepared for that mm -hmm. and, and think about, um, you know, what our audience needs and how do we keep them engaged. And, um, and I also think we have to be, um, you know, cognizant of the fact that some are hurting, some people aren't in work. Yeah. Um, so how do we actually make sure that we're a real partner by their side, getting, getting them through so, so we're not just a short term partner. And I think that's uh, one of the beauties of our industry is that we, we are so well connected and we're so supportive of each other that I think that um, we've, when they truly say we're in it together, we've got to really think about how do we actually bring everybody along on the same journey. Yeah, I think very similar to what uh, Mark from UFI has mentioned, also Karen, PCMA. I think uh, we at ICA, we, we strive uh, even harder uh, to deliver new services, uh, new products. Uh, we've been engaging with our community, especially in Asia Pacific. We had a series of uh, conversation, uh, you know, because the face of uh, this pandemic uh, change uh, almost every day, every month. So we need to understand what's really going on. Uh, we have produced uh, very similar to UFI. Uh, you know, some guidelines, some, some touch point, uh, how they can uh, uh, we change uh, their strategy, their concept, uh, how they can rebound. Uh, I think that all being done uh, in, the, in the earlier phase and also until uh, last few months. But now uh, we are moving towards, uh, towards the, the, the third and the fourth quarter of the year. Um, we are very confident about our ECA Congress, which will be held uh, this November in Kaohsiung. So, you know, we understand that uh, the possibility of um, international members might not be able to go to Chinese Taipei or Kaohsiung, uh, but uh, we have already created a regional hub concept, whereby we have uh, selected a few destinations in Europe, uh, Africa, Middle East, in Asia Pacific, and also North America to join uh, the, uh, the global members. But I think the, 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 the big takeaway that uh, we wanted to express is that not only uh, the show must go on, uh, but more importantly, uh, we, we are trying to create uh, a true sense of collaboration between the community, not just the supplier members, but also the association community and also the community out there. Uh, I think a lot of time uh, we miss out uh, on the connection with uh, the local stakeholders, uh, which is very, very important. And I think uh, that really make uh, us all stand to, 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 to see that is our key weakness. Uh, and this pandemic has really brought us uh, to that uh, new light. Um, we are almost uh, close to an hour having this uh, fantastic conversation, Mark and uh, Karen. Maybe um, this is the last question that we have from our friends at IMAX because we are not be able to be there uh, physically uh, unless we can uh, uh, smile and fly in, uh, zoom in, <laughs> or, you know, do whatever you do through the, through the electronic way. Um, the last question that they have is, uh, what is the one message that you want to convey today about our region, the Asia Pacific region to IMAX and the whole world? Well, for me, it's about we're open for business. <laughs> yeah, Karen kind of took the words out of my mouth. Yeah, I was going to say the, 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 industry, the industry is going to return to growth here in Asia first. I think everybody's looking to us to show the way uh, and that's uh, up to us to show how it's done. Yeah. Yeah. No. And I think, you know, you, you talked earlier, Noor, we are the biggest population growth region. So, so, you know, we've got people in our backyard. So the travel restrictions will open up slowly by region, as I think we all know, which is why we will be open. Um, and I also think we've got the wherewithal as a, you know, we've all lived and worked and come from this region. So we know what we're like. We work hard. Um, one of the things I am finding is super agile, um, not afraid of some change and, and a bit of adversity. 
And so, you know, we can adapt really well. And so we are open for business, but we're going to make sure that we deliver really well. And we're going to make sure that our people are the best skilled people and that, you know, all the advocacy and lobbying is going on. We're all doing our bit as a community to make sure that we come back bigger and better than ever. Might be different, but bigger and better than ever. And that's, I think, what we've just got to go away with, right? Yeah. I don't think I can improve on that answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Karen, you took the words out of our mouth. Uh, you know, I think it's just how uh, the whole community can commute uh, out of the situation. Uh, I think we will we'll be there uh, safe and sound. I think it's just a matter of time uh, we will be back uh, to IMAX and uh, to join uh, the rest of our members, friends, colleagues from around the world. Um, so I think on behalf of Mark and Karen, can we say uh, thank you and goodbye to uh, Panel IMAX uh, from Asia Pacific. All right, thanks, Nora. Thanks, Karen. Bye. Thanks, Karen. Thank you, Mark. Cheers.